Hello everyone, my name is Anna Brees. I am talking to Simon Dolan. It is the 5th of June, 2020. Now Simon is an entrepreneur. He owns around 10 businesses, employs 600 people in the UK and overseas. He's talking to me from Monaco. Simon, I became aware of you as, as with most things, emailed or somebody sent me a tweet because it's, uh, because it's very interesting to see what you're doing. You're, you've raised 160,000 um, pounds for a challenge, a legal challenge against the UK government lockdown. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and how this came about? I was just looking at the, uh, the whole lockdown thing, probably a little bit from afar, um, and, and started looking at some numbers and you know, numbers of deaths and so on, and then you know, trying to figure out what it was likely to do to the economy and so on. And, and then realised as time went by, by that the, uh, the lockdown was probably completely the wrong strategy. Um, and then didn't really think much about it because you think, well, there's nothing really you can do. You know, I never really thought about taking a government on before. And then I read an article in, um, in a paper, which was from um, a barrister, and he said that there was potential for doing a judicial review. Uh, and that was probably a, four weeks ago now, I guess. Um, and so I got in touch with him and said, well, you know, do you fancy it? And he said, yes. And, and so that was that. And so the original um, idea for setting that up was just as a conduit for a few people to put you know, hundred pounds here, hundred pounds there, right, towards the uh, towards the pot, um, and then of course it got picked up, and now we've had five, I think it's like five thousand two hundred or five thousand three hundred people um, have contributed. So how does um, this? I, I need to know, and I think people would like to know. You've got one hundred sixty thousand pounds as a legal challenge. What's happening? What can you do? What, what, what's what's the next process now? Well, the uh, the process has started. So the the. Um, the, the letter has gone in to the, uh, to the government and then they responded and then we then send our evidence in and our evidence was 1,200 pages um, long of all different reasons as to why uh, we think it's illegal and why it shouldn't exist and disproportionate and so on. I, um, I don't know if you're aware, but there's a counter challenge from a number of doctors and lawyers. They're planning action on the fact that this um, lockdown wasn't brought soon enough um, they believe that the government's breached Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights, supporting the right to life. And by allowing this virus to come in and locking down, not locking down the country and taking a kind of a herd immunity policy, which they did earlier on, they believe that, that you know, people have died um, and they could be, that could have been prevented. Are you aware of that? I haven't heard of it, but there, there are so many different challenges that could be brought. It only goes to show how tenuous the, the, what they did actually was and what a, you know, a draconian measure out of all proportions of the threat. Um, so whether you think that they should put it earlier or later or not at all or whatever, the, the fact is, is that they, they've made enormous mistakes, which is understandable, you know, bearing in mind what was going on in the rest of the world. But what's unforgivable is, is the fact that they're not willing to admit any mistakes. They're not willing to admit that anything could have been done differently. They're still clinging to the Ferguson line of half a million deaths, um, which is all, it's all been debunked. It's all rubbish. Um, what they should be doing. Well, I'll challenge you on that. And I, I have interviewed Professor Robert Endress, who, go, who works at Imperial College London, the same college as Professor Neil Ferguson. And he has looked, criticized the science behind that 500,000 modeling report by Professor Neil Ferguson back in March, he has. But then there were other people who said, well, look, we've got 50, 60,000 deaths with district lockdown. If we had those, um, uh, not done anything, maybe it would have been half a million. Because we've already got 60,000 with district lockdown. Isn't that possible? Or even if we'd gone the, the, the slightly restricted of lockdown, social distancing, we would have had quarter of a million. Did you, do you really think it's been completely to be debunked? Yes, I do. And, uh, and I say that because there's absolutely no evidence anywhere else in the world that their death figures would have been any different. So Sweden is a really good example. And I know the deaths per million and so on and so forth. But the deaths per million in Sweden are still lower than that in the UK. The other thing, you, you mentioned the, um, you know, the 50,000 50, deaths. The death recording is completely accurate. Again, as has been, uh, been indicated by, by many people, in fact, almost everybody. I think even uh, Chris Whitty came up and said it and basically said that, you know, just because they're saying they, they've got COVID on the death certificate doesn't mean they died of it. And so you could, I don't know how many of those uh, you could take. Now in Italy, when they uh, did proper autopsies on people, they found out that only 12% of people that were registered as having died of COVID, actually did die of COVID. 
So your number of 50,000 could well be 5,000 that genuinely died of COVID. And then when you think about what they did with the care homes, when they put infected people back into care homes and then wiped people out uh, that way, you know, all the deaths, or the vast majority of deaths now certainly are in care homes. Why? Well, because the government, uh, the government completely misread the situation, put it that way. And then you need to think about the amount of deaths that are caused because of lockdown. So it's not a zero sum game. You're not saying, well, we prevented one death on that side and then there's no effect on the other side of not doing lockdown. Um, of course there is, you know, the cancer diagnosis that have gone there, 60,000, 100,000, 150,000 people are supposed to die in the next couple of years from cancers that were, should have been diagnosed and would have been preventable. Heart attacks, strokes, suicides, you know. And then that's you put not that, just to come in, because that's exactly what you put on your GoFundMe page, but you've said it has and will lead to far more deaths from suicide, undiagnosed and untreated conditions. That's quite a definite statement that you've put on the GoFundMe page. It has and will lead to more deaths. Is that, do you stand by that? Do you think you're right? Yes. Fundamentally accepted. Even even uh, Hancock was quoted as saying that they think that 150,000 people are going to die because of it. And this is the UK. I mean, don't forget, there's a report yesterday from the uh, World Health Organization. They're expecting, uh, I think they said millions, millions of children to die because the vaccination uh, regime was halted so that they could put their um, uh, the resources into the, the COVID. So, you know, these things have an awful effect in, in the world. It's not just the UK. Um, yes, you know, there's a virus that's gone round. Yes, it's, it has killed people. Yes, that's terribly sad. And each individual case is terribly sad. Um, but it, the individual case that's terribly sad because of the, the COVID death, it's, it's not somehow more sad or morally superior than someone who died of cancer that would have otherwise that they would have otherwise not died or some poor kid that's committed suicide you know so uh, what it's about not the children uh, as well i mean this channel is all about protecting children and holding power to account and holding the media to account and i think about a girl that i interviewed called amy brimson and she said the only meal she had every day was a school dinner and she was also sexually abused within the family system so i do think about children like her she's she's an adult now but when she was younger and it was only five years ago you know, that was her only meal of the day. Teachers were keeping an eye on her. And she was being sexually abused by a family member. Um, she, she's very happy for me to, to, to tell people about that because she wants to prevent it from happening again in the future. So it's not just businesses, is it? It's not just undiagnosed treatment, suicides. But we don't really know. Let's be honest, we do not know yet what the figures are going to be because we're all in the middle of it, in the midst of it now. Yeah, I, time will tell. Um, I, I believe that the worst of it is coming down the road somewhere. It's going to be six months or 12 months, the economic devastation, um, and then the, the devastation on health. And, and I think in, you know, if we go three or four years down the line, which let's face it is going to be when the end of the inquiry will be, because there will be an inquiry into it, um, then we'll have the true figures. Just to finish off then, do you think we should have gone the herd immunity route? Because I cannot even talk about herd immunity without being um, getting some really aggressive not debating, I've been getting some, it's been censored on a lot of sort of platforms on Facebook. People cannot even deal with you talking about herd immunity. What do you think? We should have just done a herd immunity or social, social distancing like they did in Sweden. What, was your, what do you think we should have done? Uh, with, with the benefit of hindsight. So we need to be fair, you know, and I don't think there's too many people that would have done much different to what the government did in the initial phase of it. Um, what we should have done in hindsight, of course, is not had lockdown at all. And we should have just said, as you say, the social distancing, washing your hands. And indeed, the, the, uh, the R number, the only thing that really made a big impact on that was when the government started putting messages out about uh, social distancing and washing your hands. And from that point, the R number went from uh, two and a half to less than one. And it stayed less than one ever since. So what we should have done, of course, is not had lockdown at all. Now, if that generates herd immunity, then it does. Um, I'm not sure I really un understand that concept completely. Um, but it's, going to have a it's going to have a devastating impact on media trust and government trust as well, isn't it? Because people have been feeling and th thinking and becoming suspicious of the, the media messages, um, not feeling that maybe the government have really put their, be put their best interests at heart. You know, they, could this bring about a destabilisation in, in society, do you think? Because people have lost trust in those institutions? I think it already has. 
Um, and, and society seems to be becoming more and more fractured. Um, and you, you know, you just think about the last couple of years, so you have Brexit and Remains. You know, what a massive divide that was over something that most people didn't really understand. And certainly nobody knew what the ramifications were going to be. But people, you know, families splitting up and people fighting over whether they were a Brexiteer or a Remainer. Um, and then we have lockdown people and, you know, who are desperate to be locked down. Um, and the people who don't want to be. And then all of a sudden that seems to have become antagonistic and quite violent. Um, and then that absolutely, seems... Absolutely, absolutely. I've really... And so many families and the rows that... Exactly. It's, you're yeah, right, it's fractured us. It's divided us. And then you've got the, the whole Black Lives Matter thing, uh, you know, the protests over the weekend. Uh, you see that as anger that's, that's spilling out. And now all of a sudden we've got... It's not blacks against whites, because most there was mostly white people that seemed to be doing the uh, the looting and the attacking and all the other bits and pieces. Um, so again, you've got this weird divide in society, and and then you can go all the way. You know, you start getting into the conspiracy theory route about whether that's what's actually being designed. You know, are you do they do they want division in society? Um, I don't know. I'm not so sure I believe that. But we're certainly in a far more fractured time sure and the things like this don't help so some may, people may say society was broken before this and now it's even further broken even further and it's like you say some people say i've got a, a london cabbie dean frost who said it feels like the media is telling me to look over here something else is going on and people have become suspicious you, you know you mentioned conspiracy theories but if we're vulnerable if we're weak that's when you can bring in censorship, isn't it? That's when you can bring in surveillance, contact tracing, take our data, give away the data of where we're going. You need apps to get into supermarkets. You need to have health passports to travel. It's, what is the, just to finish on a positive note, what is, the, um, what is the way out of this? And then we'll finish the interview. What do you think we can do moving forward now? Uh, there, need, there needs to be a new... Um, way of thinking politically, you know, very vaguely politically. I don't mean politicians, I mean politically. At the moment, we have this purely artificial and completely wrong divide between left and right. And we're taught that it's a line that's far left and far right. You know, so you have communism on one end and you have fascism on the other. End. And everybody is somehow on this line, you know, and it, the best you can be is a centrist, which is neither one thing or another. You know? Um, and I think we need to think about it differently. You know, there, there is no line. It's actually a circle. So if you imagine it was a clock face, actually communism and fascism are both at 12 o'clock. They're both exactly the same thing, almost exactly the same thing. They both involve a totalitarian government. Um, and what we need to be doing is thinking more about what's on the other side, what's at six o'clock of that clock, you know? Um, what's on the other side of that? And not having this awful artificial divide between left and right, because that is divisive and you have completely the wrong argument. Yeah. I think it's about values and principles aligning as well. That's what I see. I see people on the left and right, but both, they both care about children. They want both hold the power to account. They want a robust media and a government that has compassion and is held to account. So you're right, I, um, I agree with you. Something new, something, something beautiful and powerful and um, full of vision and light for the best of us all could come from this, couldn't it? Something really inspirational could rise in, in a form of new type of politics and a new type of media, which I promote. I think if we're, yeah, if we're, if we're looking for, for positives out of this, then I think that could be one. It certainly could be, yeah. Really lovely to talk to you. I really appreciate it. You take care. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.